still connecting here we go awesome <laughs> all right hello uh thank you all for for logging in and and having a, a chat with us we're going to do this one a little different so i'll just start off with a few housekeeping things uh first of all my name is matthew edwards i'm the vice chair for silverdale business uh and today's webinar we've got care retention and culture uh, of a remote workforce uh, and I will or hand over to, to Simon and Tarina very shortly uh, but just to, to cover off a couple of things we're going to make this one a little bit more interactive so as we go through the the presentation and, and the talk uh, there will be points where you can either raise your hand and come up onto the, the stage and, and have a chat directly or pop questions into the q a so on the the right hand side of your screen you'll see a, a chat box which has already been used uh, but there's also a q a section so if you've got specific questions uh, pop them in there and i can read them out on your behalf uh, and at the end uh, if there's any additional questions, by all means, throw them in and we'll definitely answer them as best we can. But without further ado, I will hand it over and hide myself from the screen until I'm needed. So <laughs> by all means, take it away. Thanks, Matt. Now, let me see if I can. Share screen, love it. Share screen. And find the button that says. Yeah, bottom right. Go to the bottom. To left, 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 left. Uh, stop. <laughs> okay. Oh, no. It's up on my other screen. Okay, we should have taken some time to practice this. Um, maybe I will just stop sharing that. Hi yeah. guys, <laughs> sorry about that. My name is Terina and this is Simon. Um, so we're from The People Place. It's great to be here with you guys virtually today um, and to be able to have a bit of a chat and a discussion about the care retention and culture of a remote workforce. Um, like Matt said, we're really keen to make this interactive. If you have any questions at any stage, we're keen to hear what challenges you're facing, what opportunities you've had, what wins you've had, um, and yeah, just to to share and and understand what's working and what's not for you guys, and see if there's anything that we may be able to offer um, in terms of support or advice. Um, so the people place we support our clients basically with the HR aspect of their business. So whether that's through providing some templates um, and policies and things for them, or if they need some consultancy sort of advice, or if you're scaling and growing and you get to a point where you go, actually, we might need an entire HR function within our business, um, then we can pick that up as well. So yeah, that's a bit about us. Our goal is just to make things easy for the businesses we support, basically. How do we take that off their hands? How do we provide the support that works um, for them? Anything I missed there, Simon? You know, no, that, that pretty much nails it. I think um, you, it, we started five years ago, um, predominantly in Auckland, and now we've, um, you know, within a couple of years, uh, the founder, Nat Milne, she had um, clients all over New Zealand, and that's when a few of us in the South Island started. So um, I'm actually based here in Christchurch, um, um, and Tarina's in Auckland and the most of the team's in Auckland um, but yeah basically when a business gets to a certain size and they start hating their life because there's too much HR to do they call us and we're like what's up yeah we can help um, and as Tarina said it's anything anything to do with HR and we did have a PowerPoint that kind of showed the different stuff but for whatever reason that's, that's... Sorry. no no hey that would have happened to me that you know <laughs> that is what it is so yeah so that's the people place um, and um, probably the only thing, other thing to say there is we don't compete with EmployShore or MyHR. Um, often those are, they're kind of the most popular, well-known HR outsource providers. Um, we don't compete in that space. Um, we compete when a business wants to hire an internal person. So that's, that's where we fit. Yeah. Awesome. Um, there is a relatively small group this, this afternoon. Are there any particular questions that anyone has that that you'd like us to kind of start with or 
Otherwise, I'll just kind of kick off and we can revert back mm. whenever you're ready. Nope. Okay. Um, so one of the one of the things we wanted to talk about as a starting point is you may have heard at the moment we've got a bit of a talent shortage. Um, so they're calling this at the moment the great resignation is kind of the tagline that seems to be coming up here. And what we've seen is Basically, with the borders being closed for a little while now, we've got less um, numbers of talent that we're able to bring in from overseas, um, and that's starting to hit businesses. So, what we're starting, what we have been seeing, I suppose, for about a year now, um, is that you've got people being offered salaries, you know, sometimes up to twenty thousand dollars more for the exact same job that they're currently doing, um, and you've just got people constantly looking and searching for roles within different organizations and, and chasing the money effectively. Um, so that has been something that's come up a lot with a number of our organizations. And when we talk to them, we always talk about the full, um, I suppose, employee life cycle. So from start to finish. So just the, the importance, I suppose, of how you show up in the market, right from your employer brand and their recruitment space and how you manage um, people through that journey. So it may not necessarily be that um, someone is the right candidate for a role, for example, but making sure they have a good experience. So even if they don't get a role at your organization, they still walk away feeling like, hey, I didn't get that, but actually that was a really cool place and I'd love to work with them in future. Or if I was at a barbecue on Saturday and talking about them, I'd go, oh, look, I applied for a role, I didn't get it, but they seem like great people and the brand seems great, the culture seems great. So, so it's just that that idea of your employer brand in the marketplace and, and thinking about that from start to finish. And the same thing at the other end, um, when you're exiting employees out of the organization, you know, people leave for a number of reasons, um, but how do you try and have that be a positive exit? So they might go, hey, actually, I've been offered a whole lot of money somewhere else, um, and it may be something you can't compete with. But what we have find is, found is organizations where employees leave and then actually their, their bosses have gone hey look not a problem it's been great working with you you added so much value to the business um if you know if you're looking for a role in future let us know you we often find that people will actually come back at some stage um and and they'll kind of think about it and think actually you know even though i left i left on a good note i would still talk positively about that organization out in the marketplace um, and I suppose the the idea with COVID, um, there was a seminar recently talking about the Great Resignation and whether it was an opportunity um, or a curse, <laughs> and and what the impact of COVID has been, and whether COVID was really the the kind of instigator of a number of the issues we're seeing in the marketplace, or whether it was just the trigger um, and part of a different kind of piece of the puzzle, I suppose. What have you been seeing out there at the moment, Simon? Yeah, um, thanks, Tarina. Um, so I suppose speaking a bit more um, anecdotally now about our, our current client base um, and, and what we're seeing as well as, um, so I'm in a sales role at the, the People Place um, and uh, out and about connecting with lots of different business owners. Um, so in terms of our clients and the, and the people I'm seeing, there is a lot of movement um, and a lot of people leaving, as Tarina said, for higher pay, just insane. Um, I literally uh, had a, yesterday, had a coaching session um, with one of my clients and he has just got a new job and he's getting 40000 more uh, for the exact same role in a different company. So it's kind of a no-brainer for him to, um, to, to move on. Now, the, the, the two main reasons are higher pay and... Um, and culture or poor culture and this is why people are moving and obviously with the closed borders it's just a can uh, um, people can kind of just pick and choose and they've just got so much choice because people are just looking um, so many organizations are looking and there's so much movement um, one of our clients who's currently um, looking to fill a position um, in the tech sector um, they we run their recruitment for them and they're for this exact same role, there are a thousand other job ads being advertised for that same role from different companies just in Christchurch alone, not nationwide. That's just in Christchurch. 
which is insane. Like that is like the head recruiter of our firm has never seen that ever before. Um, so I guess what that tells us is there's there's a lot of people looking to find talent and um, and, and, and are struggling. Um, and so headhunting is just, it's just out there. People have just been headhunted and offering and higher salaries. So we've had lots of clients come on board and wanting us to do REM reviews um, and help them basically figure out what is fair pay, um, what is and how to make their um, organizations attractive. And if you can't compete with higher pay, what can you do in the culture space? Um, another uh, another um, friend I have, um, he's in a team of 13 people. And in the eight months that he's been there, 10 have left. Um, and he's only been there eight months and now he's just left because again, higher pay and the culture was terrible. Um, so this company now, um, my friend, as he was leaving, he said, um, just recommended us, said, look, I think you guys need to sort your, your culture out because you're just not going to keep people. And obviously with 10 out of 13 leaving, now 11 out of 13 leaving, um, there's definitely something odd and off there. Uh, so this company's reaching out and they want some support with culture. So it's definitely seen that across the board. That's not just with our clients, lots of, um, lots of other businesses that are looking to really um, double down on what can we do to retain people if we can't match pay? And it is in that culture space, how you communicate. Um, and, and it starts at the top, starts at the leadership um, and making sure that, you know, there isn't an eggshell culture where people are walking on toes, you know, because of the higher pay rates people can get elsewhere, um, they're going to jump ship. And um, if they're just fed up from, you know, culture that they haven't been happy with, they're going to leave. Um, so lots of our clients and other businesses we're seeing are, um, they're, they're starting to do something about that. So starting to invest in that culture space um, and especially around communication, which which Tarina, I'll pass back to you, is going to Yeah, Yes, I, and I, I had a call with a client last night um, who, funnily enough, he was talking to me and saying, oh, I've had someone resign, you know, that's the fourth person in the last year. Um, and I smiled at him and I said, look, you, you do so much great stuff um, with your culture and I think that's a testament to the number of people you've had resigned. We actually have what's called being labelled the great resignation at the moment. Um, and people are leaving left, right and centre. The fact that you've only had four people leave yeah. within the past year is actually um, great. And, and he was feeling concerned about those four people. And he said, this person's left for a job down the road doing the exact same thing. They're paying 25k more. Um, and I said, you know, that's that's a challenge. Um and, and it's not easily solved. So there's been a lot of, um, there was a seminar the other morning and there's, there are conversations about bidding wars happening and, you know, where does it stop? How much extra do you start paying? If you increase pay over mm. here, how do you then increase it for someone over here? Um, and it becomes unsustainable. So like Simon said, it does really come back then to culture. Um, and, and absolutely that's starting at the top. Um, and so it's trying to figure out, I suppose, what kind of culture you want your business to have. Um, and I think historically that may have been something that you kind of thought about, but it wasn't front and centre of your mind. And I think now actually with the talent shortage, it's something that um, has become a lot more important and, and is requiring a lot more intention. Um, and I think the we, we've got a few pieces to talk to on a remote workforce and how you help the culture in that space. But these points do really resonate for those people who, I suppose, just for culture generally, um, mm -hmm. and for those people who are have remote workforces and also those who have workforces that are client facing. Um, so we kind of pulled together about six tips on managing a remote workforce. So the key overarching theme for that was communication. Um, and, and the first point being over communicate. If you think that you're maybe over communicating, you're probably only just communicating enough with your staff. Um, there are so many mixed messages that can get lost um, in communication. And I know from a remote workforce point of view, the ability to kind of have those in-person conversations um, and you know take people's cues um, has become a lot harder working remotely. And so it's it's really about communicating um, how do you build in water cooler type conversations 
Um, and and that's something that we've started doing at the People Place is, is a couple of times a week we have a water cooler um, catch up chat where it's purely, hey, bring a cup of coffee. What are you guys up to? How's life going? Um, you know, how are the kids? What, what's happening in your world? So that it's not just about talking to people when you've got a set meeting on a particular project or account. It is actually building in that time where you may have previously been sitting next to each other and gone, hey, you want to pop up the road and grab coffee? It's actively building in those communication points. Mm. Um, the second point is, is essentially communication as well, but it's how do you understand what your different employees need? Um, so how do you how do you understand, for example, you've got a new um, senior developer and they come in and you, and you may be able to hand them a project and go, hey, this is what we need. Here are the specs, here's the client. And they might go, awesome, and you know take a step back and go and work on it. Um, but you may have someone that comes in and and actually requires that little bit more support and handholding and wants to check in with you and wants to understand, hey, am I on the right track? You know, this this is what I've built so far. Does that look right? Is that something the client would be expecting? And so it's really booking in those conversations to touch base and go, hey, how are you doing? You know, d did you have any questions or what questions do you have? And providing that safe space for them to ask those questions and and not feel like they're a burden or they're taking up additional time. Because I think when you're in a work office environment, it's a lot easier to just tap someone on the shoulder and go, hey, Sai, can you just help me out? I was gonna do this for this client. I saw you've worked with them before. What are your thoughts? Is that something that would resonate with them? Mm -hmm. um, so that's a lot harder to do when you're working remotely. Um, so it's kind of, yeah, build, building in those extra questions. Um, and just making sure you're understanding what works for some members of your team might not work for other members of your team and, and finding out what makes them tick, um, how they like to receive feedback and all of that sort of thing. Um, that kind of leads into setting clear expectations. So what what work is due when? Is there a certain time frame that you're expecting it? You know, what is the quality of the work? Are you expecting a first round draft by Friday or actually were you thinking that that was going to be all the bells and whistles ready to you know hand over to a client so it's setting those expectations and being really clear about that because where you previously may have just you know had a quick conversation and gone hey this is where things are at does that sound right is that what you're thinking you actually do need to build that in now so so setting clear expectations when you're handing out work and so that your employees know what to expect, basically. Um, like I mentioned, we have a couple of water cooler catch up conversations now. So what's your team rhythm? And that's our fourth tip, create a team rhythm, whether that's Friday afternoon drinks, um, Wednesday, you sit down and you have lunch together and have a chat. You know, if you're working remotely, how do you build that in? And I suppose even if you're not working remotely, but you're in the office, or you have employees where some are in the office and some are at home. Um, my, I had a team of people and we would say, right, Tuesdays, everyone needs to work in the office. Um, let's all, you know, go out for lunch. So we had different people working different days, but at least there was one day of the week where we could catch up. And that may not be quite right for the current COVID environment. Um, it may be that you have split teams and make sure that out of those split teams, you know, there's one day where people are going to see other people in the team. Um, so it's it's kind of adjusting that in our COVID environment, but also recognising that we will hopefully be heading out the other end um, of this COVID situation soon. So it's, yeah, understanding how, how you can make that work right now and in the future. Uh, the fifth point is your availability. So, so having, um, I suppose, open door time is what I'd call it. So if you previously had an office and people could come by and knock on the door, how do you make it clear, hey, I'm going to be in this Google meetup room or in this Teams meeting room for the, you know, for an hour at 9 a.m. every day, if anyone wants to jump in and have a chat or have any questions, so providing that space for employees to be able to do that. Um, and the last point that I think definitely holds true kind of across the board, um, working remotely, working in the office, 
is having an iterative growth mindset. So how do you basically make sure that you're always taking the approach of, right, you know, what's working and what's not? How do I get your feedback? I think at the end of the day, we all want to do a good job. You know, we all want to um, provide great service to clients. Um, and so how do we how do we make sure that we pivot early before something becomes a problem? How do you open up the communication line so that you're regularly checking in? And I think expecting some feedback as well. Lots of people say, right, has anyone got any feedback? Um, and everyone's sitting there thinking, yep. <laughs> I have a lot to say to you, but nothing you'd want to hear. So how do you open up the conversation lines and say, hey, I'd like to hear one thing from you that I can do better, that I can work on. So that there's actually an expectation that you provide that feedback. It's not just an open question. Um, because otherwise people, at the end of the day, they don't, they actually often don't need the hassle of providing feedback to someone that's not open to it. Um, it doesn't often end up doing them much good if if they're providing feedback that's um that someone's not receptive to now i just talked at you for a number of minutes does anyone have any questions or has anyone found um any of those sorts of points useful in their own work environment or any challenges that you're currently facing Doesn't look like anyone's popping any questions in the chat yet. Matt, uh, what about you? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll... <laughs> throw us a bone, Matt. Come on. <laughs> I mean, you're going over quite a few points that, to be honest, that I've I've experienced as an employee previously, and the reasons people leave jobs and and that sort of thing, uh, which obviously is happening more and more now. Uh, you've given a, a, a couple of examples of how to improve team culture or company culture, but something like um, the last point you mentioned about being in a digital room, like a Google Meet room for an hour every Monday or every 9 a.m., whatever it may be. How do you how do you go about promoting that and getting buy-in from your team itself? Because that, that, to be honest, from, from my point of view, running my own business now, the, the hardest thing isn't coming up with ideas on how to improve it. It's then getting buy-in from, from other people to go, oh yeah, let's jump in at nine o'clock and just have a random chat with the boss, so to speak. Mm. Um, although I don't use that term, that's still the connotation that they have with me. Sure. Yeah. Um, and that's a good, that's definitely a good question because I think what I've found in, in group environments, even in the office, is a situation where you say, right, has anyone got any feedback? Or would anyone like to offer any points on a particular subject? Um, and everyone just kind of sits there and stares and you're waiting thinking, I know you've all got something to say. Um, but I think, like I said before, having an expectation, I found personally of, you know, hey, what's one thing I can do better? What's one thing you'd like to see? What's one thing you like about the business? So it's actually, it's not just saying, have you got any feedback? Or what are you liking about working here? Because sometimes that becomes almost too much, like they could say so many different things. Whereas if you're saying, um, look, I, I'm actively looking at the moment about how we can make this business a better place. Please help me. What is one thing that I can do better? Um, you know, and, and inviting it in that slightly different way, I've found helps. And then other than that, building the rapport um, with each of the people is, is really the easiest way. And finding out, I know, in my team, I had a team of people and a couple of them didn't actually like talking in a group environment. And so I always found they weren't speaking up. And so I kind of said, hey, what's more useful for you? Some people like to reflect on questions and they don't like to be put on the spot. And so they said, oh, actually, I'd, I'd prefer if I can kind of, you know, think about it ahead of time 
and then come to the meeting prepared to talk on that subject. I'm not good when I'm put on the spot. So it's then, and it, that comes back to identifying the different people in your team and how you adjust your communication to kind of meet each of their needs. What okay. are your thoughts, Sai? Yeah, uh, sorry, did you have something to say there, Matt, before I jump in? No, I just said okay. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think that's right on the money. That, that's, that's, that's definitely one angle to take is actually ask people like it's really important to set up a system and a mechanism that's going to work for your people. So telling us hundred percent on the money there, it's, it's asking, you know, in terms of your question, Matt, about buy-in, how do I get buy-in to this Tuesday 9 a.m. meeting? Well, ask, ask the people like the reality is like we have to meet and if we have no connection, we're going to have no culture. Like, you know, you need people meeting together to build a culture. Um, so firstly, when, when does that work? And then, um, yeah, asking how people, how, how that could roll. So that's one angle to take. The other thing I'd say is, um, I think it comes down to leadership and vision. Um, you're, you know, whether you're a small company or a big company and it's a team meeting or if it's just a small company, so it's the whole company meeting together. Um, in terms of getting buy-in, I think it comes down to the, vis the, the vision that the leader casts. Um, why is it important? Like you, you're in business because you're, you're wanting to help and solve problems for your clients or for your people or for your customers, whatever that, you know, the business objective is. Um, and hope's not a method. You're not going to suddenly have good culture um, just by like hoping that it's going to happen. You, you need to set out systems. So all the modern day empirical research around building a good culture talks about, they call it system interventions. And if you have system interventions at the different building blocks that create a high performing team, um, that's, that's what's going to create the, the culture. And that's how you get buy-in as you, do that process with your people. So, if, you know, a real basic model for building a high-performing team, it's called the five dysfunctions of a team. And the bottom layer is trust. If you have good trust, you can have good communication. If you have good communication, you have good commitments. Um, and you can commit to what we need to do as a team. If we have commitments, we can hold people accountable and make sure we're actually meeting, you know, achieving. And then if we hold people accountable, we have results. So results, accountability, commitments, communication, trust. And as a model for building a high-performing team, you have to have systems at each of those building blocks. Um, so to get buy-in, it's casting the vision of like, why, do, why are we in business in the first place? And if we want to have a good culture, if we want to achieve these results up here, well, we need to make sure we're building trust. If we're going to build trust, we need to meet once a week if it's virtually and we're working more remotely because of a COVID environment or just a new workforce because there's going to be much more remote working moving forward. If we want to build trust and have a foundation of trust because we're not going to have a successful team and organization without trust if we want to do that hope isn't a method we have to meet and that's where Tarini's point comes in let's look at um well how do we meet what do we want to do in this meeting is it you know having coffee is it what, what are we talking about giving people a chance to reflect but you do need to do that and i think if the leader casts a vision and gives that bigger picture of the why that's what gets by and but doing that process with your people having the people come together and create those rhythms, those team rhythms that Tarina was talking about. Together we come up, what are we going to do to build trust? And we figure that out together. What are we going to do to create a communication culture? We're not walking on eggshells. We can actually ask for direct feedback. Again, hope's not a method. That's not just going to happen. We need to practice that. I think the best example I could, or best analogy I could give is, dare I say it, in a, in a Kiwi culture is, is using a rugby analogy. But if anyone knows anything about rugby and I, and I, apologize if this is going to turn you off so please comment now and let me know if this analogy sucks but you know um graham henry turned the all blacks around between 2007 and 11 well you know let's forget about the 2007 world cup where we we lost out that's a ref's fault but what he did was before other coaches was he he did the basics he came in and he set this new culture and the culture was until we can do the basics right let's forget about all the flary you know carlos spencer boomerang kicks um, let's do the basics. Let's catch the ball and let's do the passes. Let's get the kicks, catch the high ball, all the basics. And that's where he changed the culture by doing the basics. And it's no different. Um, and obviously then they won the World Cup, two World Cups, in fact. Um, and it's no different for a team. It's doing the basics. And you have to do the basics at each of those building blocks um, to create a high-performing team. Hope is not a method. It won't just happen. It has to be system interventions will, will change that. Thank you. I'm pretty sure that answers 
one of the questions or the question that's been popped in, which is uh, from Melanie saying, I manage subcontractors who work remotely. Any tips on how to get them to buy into our company's vision? Um, that layered approach you were just talking about seems to work perfectly for that. But is there anything else that you would like to, to add into uh, to answer this question specifically? Yeah. Oh, sorry, Tanya, do you go? No, the only thing I was going to say is, um, is like I said, building them into that culture. And even though they're subcontractors, taking them on the journey with you. Um, so I've worked in a business where, where we kept them separate and it was like, right, they're subcontractors, they're over there, we pay them, they do a job, they come in. And then actually what we found is the culture that they were reflecting wasn't matching that of the brand we wanted them to. So we actually went, actually, how do we bring them in right from the start? What is their induction into this business? And mm. right from their kind of first day, we're saying, right, this is the culture that we want and the, these are expectations we have. And then kind of having some checkpoints around along the way, because obviously if you've got people that have been subcontracting for you for five, ten years or whatever it may be, how do you have checkpoints along the way to kind of include them into your culture a bit more? So whether that's, I don't know, your annual Christmas party or, or you know, mm. a family day or whatever it may be, but just kind of keeping tabs and connections there um, is what we found useful in terms of making sure we've clearly articulated and shared that vision um, and the expectations as well around kind of behaviour and culture um, and building that into your policies and procedures and then holding them to account for that. So including mm -hmm. that in um, the contract that you have with those some contractors of that, you know, these are the expectations that we have of you as subcontractors um, and if you breach these, you know, then that's not going to align with our organization's values and that sort of thing. Okay. Thank you. Um, we do have another question. Uh, well, I'm, I'm seeing it as I'm reading it. So, uh, yes, thanks. Uh, I'm inducting now. Uh, this is obviously from Melanie responding uh, that it helps a lot and over communicate, share a vision, clear expectations and have checkpoints. That's pretty much her, her takeaway from that. Love awesome. it. Dude, you summarized it for us. Fantastic. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's right on the money. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. So um, there was one question that, that I came up with while, while you were talking and a, a lot of, a lot of what we have spoken about seems to be very work focused. So I, uh, team meeting, about the project or company meeting about projects, et cetera, you know, talking about, uh, Hey, Simon, you've had experience with this client, blah, blah, blah. What, what do you think about this? What about non work related activities? So I'll, I'll give you an example of something I, I came up with the other day for my team, because we all work remotely. Uh, and there's people from, or well, actually one, one of one of my team has uh, moved back overseas to back home to, to India because uh, there was family troubles going on. Uh, and so there's obviously a bit of a, a time difference there and there's quite a bit of a, a cultural difference. Uh, but then there's, yeah, because of that, I came up with the idea of having everyone put into a, a, a Slack channel, so a group chat, different ideas for uh, their favorite foods from, from their own culture. And because I personally like to cook, I would cook it, take photos and, and so forth of, of me doing their, their favorite dishes. And they would just roast the hell out of me for, for how authentic <laughs> or, or not authentic it was. Um, so that that's quite a very much non-work related. It's got nothing to do with web development or anything like that, that we do. Um, but that was something that the whole team jumped on pretty much immediately. They thought that was a hilarious idea and get a few kicks out of it. Is there anything like that or non-work related, or would you even recommend that sort of thing uh, to, to your own clients? A hundred percent. My goodness. Yes. Well, like I, I mentioned, you know, I think you know, the answers there for, you know, within what you've said, Matt is, 
what did that exercise do for your team? What what do you felt that did? What did that achieve? I, I, we've only, well, I've only just come up with the idea this week, to be honest, and put it to everyone on Tuesday. Uh, so hasn't really gone too far yet, but right. the initial response was, I'm in. <laughs> like everyone did seem to, to like the idea. Yeah. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll see how it goes. But, but, but it builds um, trust, right? You're, you're building yeah. shared experience, having having some laughs together. That's what it does. You're, it's that foundational um, building block of a high-performing team is you're building trust. Trust, Building trust isn't just about like having – you know, the team meeting and whatnot. Yeah, obviously that, that's what the angle that we're talking about previous to, to your question, but a hundred percent, man, you've got to have the, you've got to have the fun. I can, there's kind of like um, two massive things a leader can do for their organization. One, have fun. That's what our boss does. Like she just loves the, you know, loves a good time. So, you know, we often, well, pre COVID and, you know, when we could travel a bit more and get out and about, go out for, go out for dinner together, you know, all those things you, you need to do it. Having fun together um, builds it builds um, it builds trust. And the other thing is love your people. Seems like a thing you can't say in the corporate world or in the business world, but it's true. <laughs> Send your people, I don't know, frozen lasagnas when life's a bit crappy, or like you know, it's love on your people and have fun. One hundred percent. That's what builds that foundational building block. Yeah, that, that's what builds trust. One hundred percent. Absolutely. Um, and we love some good banter at the People Place. Um, we're all about <laughs> the good banter and catching up. And I think, you know, the idea of you being a separate person to your work identity now has completely shifted. Um, and so it should, you know, we all come with different, um, you know, highs and lows happening on in the background. And it's it's sharing that in a safe space and, and having the platform and the trust um, with a new work environment to do that. And we had a similar, you know, take a photo of your lockdown loaf um, kind of thing back in one of the previous lockdowns, which was fun. And it's building that sort of thing in. Um, and I think your mention of the different culture and, and how do you transcend that um, in a lighthearted kind of way through food, which is something we all mm. need to kind of, um, you know, we all eat food every day. So it's something that transcends some of those cultural boundaries too um and having some of those water cooler type conversations like where they are just about people is always great um and it is just thinking outside the box on what else you could do so we had a bingo during one of the first lockdowns and it was you know you get to mark a token on your bingo chart if your child runs in and into your office in the middle of a zoom meeting or you know and you'd be like yes tick that one off right i'm winning my child has just interrupted a work meeting um, but how do you, you know, do some of that kind of stuff where it's fun? Um, and I think importantly, though, adjusting for different people. So, you know, some people do just want to get on with their work. So how do you provide enough space for that bit of banter, but not so much? I, I had a team with predominantly very young um, people for a little while, and, and there was a lot of need or, um, you know, desire for banter and like Friday drinks and lots of different things and then opposed to a couple of the older ones who are like actually you know what I want to come in I want to do my job and I want to go home um so how do you also kind of find that balance with people who have different interests and in, and in how involved they might want to be in the social side um of work but that sounds like a great idea and if you'd like to invite Simon and I onto your work chat about um <laughs> your meal photos we will gladly accept. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, there is a pretty related comment, actually, that David's popped in the, the questions that I saw while I was talking. Um, he, he says, I personally do not like company events and personal time. Uh, do you have any comments around using personal time for fun business activities? Yeah, and that's right on the money, David. I've actually just found the tab where it has all the questions. I'm glad that now that we're most of the way through, I've found the questions here. Um, that's a great point, David, and that speaks exactly to the point that I was just making around making sure that um, that your events do match, you know, and adjusting for all of your people, because I, I absolutely understand that. I've got two small children at home, 
um, and, you know, constantly feeling like I need to attend all of these work events to feel like I can then partake in the banter at work and be a part of the um, conversations and that, you know, that that's challenging. So I completely understand. Um, and it is it is just finding that balance. What can you do where mm. it creates some trust, some banter, um, but also doesn't mean that all of your events are outside of work um, and some cultural kind of activities are things that we really kind of recommend and, and enjoy. So how do you feature in, for example, it might be once a quarter team building activities. Um, when you can afford it, it might be a team building day for the, the whole business to get out of the office and do, you know, an amazing race or to do um, a team planning day for the next annual year or for the next quarter. Um, it might be taking some time to do some team building stuff where you have kind of lunch and learn sessions. So it's it's during work hours um, and you're kind of, you know, factoring that in basically so people aren't there working late when actually they need to get home to kids or pets or whoever it might be. Cool. Um, this one, you, you have touched on a, a few ideas just in that last comment, but are there are there any ideas or you know styles of events or team building exercises that you've found uh almost universal that can work for any type of business at you know whether it's a, a small business with five or ten people or a larger business with you know 50 to 100. Um, are, there, are there any that you would recommend people just think about and, and see if their team would like to be involved in something? Good question. Um, I think it's it's coming together with your team and understanding what your team members are like and what they may like. Mm. Really wondering if you can hear the screaming of my children outside the door. Sorry. Just a little. Um, it's, <laughs> it's, but it is about understanding your team. I am a competitive person. We did an amazing race type activity um, through work a number of years ago. I worked for a corporate challenge um, group when I was at university. And that kind of stuff I find like so much fun, like let me, you know, push anyone out of the way to win the game and race ahead. But that's because I'm a competitive person and I enjoy that. I had colleagues that were kind of rolling their eyes, couldn't believe they had to walk across the viaduct and get all sweaty um, and, you know, didn't didn't enjoy it. But I thought it was the best thing ever. So I think it's really, yeah, finding what your teammates like. Yeah, definitely. It's got to be team specific and people specific. I don't think there's one size that fits all. So yeah, I totally agree, Tarina. Um, other than like food tends to be pretty, you know, that seems to transcend most most cultures and most um, work environments and yeah, most industries for sure. Yeah. Cool. Uh, do you have any tips about pulling that information out of people? So you you're saying it really needs to be team specific and, and Tarina was saying how she's quite a competitive person. Uh, are there, are there any tips to pull that sort of personality information out of your, your team and, and employees or, or subcontractors? Something that I um, found has worked, not just with kind of finding a fun activity, but um things like getting feedback. So what are people enjoying? What are they not enjoying is a post-it note type exercise. And I know I'm trying to remember the name. There's a name of a um, online post-it note thing as well that I can't quite think of, but I can let you know later. Um, and so you basically, everyone has a post-it note pad and you go, right, what are um, either, what are five things that you want to improve about the organization? So each person has to come up with five post-it notes worth. So a different piece on each different post-it and you stick it on the board and then once everyone's done that you basically read all of the feedback and you pull them okay well there's quite a few people that would like to see an improvement on this aspect and so the same for kind of fun activities as well if you had um say you know five ideas for activities you might go right can everyone hear us five ideas to start us off everyone write down two extra ideas that you like and put it up on the board. And then once you've got all the ideas, you can kind of have either post-it notes or little, I don't know, blue stars, red stars, whatever. And each person has to choose, right, my first choice of activity would be this one, this one. And then you're basically just grouping them together. But I think it comes down to that um, 
piece I mentioned earlier around expecting buy-in as well. So it's not what what I always struggle with is, oh, so what do you guys think? Has anyone got any ideas? And then it's like crickets chirping. You know, no one wants to be the one to say something. For some reason, it's like it's not a cool thing to have some really cool ideas. Um, but yeah, so so it's then, right, we'll write down two ideas. It's not, do you have any ideas? Because everyone has ideas. It's getting them to share, like you said. Okay. No, that, that's really good. Thank you. Um, I don't think there, yeah, there doesn't seem to be any further questions. So I, I'm pretty sure that's pretty much it. Do you have any final uh, final statements or thoughts that you want to, to get across? Oh, I think, I think uh, Melanie's um, summary was fantastic. <laughs> I think that pretty much nailed it on the head. Thanks, Mel. <laughs> yeah. No, I think, um, yeah, well, I would say, I suppose, is feel free to reach out if you've got any questions or um, want to chew the fat on any challenges that you're facing, any share any wins. You know, we love to hear, hey, we had this issue or this particular thing came up and we tried this and it really worked for us. So we'd, we'd love to hear about that as well. But yeah, feel free to sing out. We yeah. love some good banter and yeah. Cool. Thanks Thanks for my, my final thought would be hope isn't a method. Like you won't build culture. You won't retain your people unless you're actually making plans to do that. Um, and, you know, you've, you've got a system of how you think that stuff through, whether it's a five dysfunctions of a team model or whatever. But there's heaps of different models out there. But it's actually, actually having a plan and, and trying. And being okay, it's okay to fail as well. You know, the business business world, life, it's complex and you, you never know, there's no defined sort of outcome. So just giving things a go, well, that didn't work, try again. And, and creating that culture where it's okay to fail, um, I think is really important. It's okay, you know, to fail because we learn from that. Perfect. So you, you did touch on, on something there. Uh, how do people get in touch with you if they want to, to continue the conversation? If you visit our website, um, you can you just follow your nose on the website and you can um, fill out a, um, a form and we can you know and get in touch with us through that. Um, there's also on our website a number you can call, which actually goes to my cell phone. Um, so I will pick up um, or you can leave a message and I'll, I'll get that. But yeah, go to our website, um, fill out. And we'll share our, our email with you as well, perhaps, Matt, or maybe we can put our email in the comments. I don't know if people see Great. that. Yeah, um, I'll just post the, the, the website address and then when we do a, a summary of this and send it out to all our members, we'll, we'll include some more contact details for you. Cool. Awesome. Perfect. All right. Thanks well, for having us. Thank you. Yeah. So the last thing I want to say is just thank you for everyone who attended. Uh, and thank you both to Tarina and, and Simon from the People Place for, for coming on board and, and sharing their expertise. It's very much appreciated. Thank you. No worries. Thanks, Thanks. All right. See you later. Bye.